Hello, and welcome to the monthly Bangkok RELA webinar. My name is Kelly Calvert, and I'm broadcasting from Chiang Mai on behalf of the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok. I'm happy to welcome today Alison Orr. Uh, she's our webinar presenter of the month and an English language fellow for the U.S. Department of State. She currently teaches research methods, implied linguistics, and TESOL best practices in the Graduate School at Royette Rajapat University. Today, Allison will be sharing some interesting techniques for using roll cards in your classroom. The webinar will be about 45 minutes with time for questions at the end. If you have a question, please put it in the chat box and it will be addressed during the Q&A part of the webinar. Allison, please take it away. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, this is my first time doing a webinar, so um, please bear with me. <laughs> um, so um, this is, um, as Kelly mentioned, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, cooperative learning. Um, this is a little bit of a buzzword. I hear a lot of my te teachers um, that I teach in Miami program talk about how they need to um, incorporate this more into their classroom. Um, and so I'm going to show you one way or one tool or one method of doing that is by using roll cards and using groups. Um, so let me, there we go. So uh, let's do a little warm up, um, like all good teachers, right? Uh, so in the chat box, um, I want you to write one challenge that you currently face in your English language classrooms. It's just one challenge. Um, for example, uh, one that I hear a lot is large class sizes. Um, so we'll give you a minute. You know, Kelly, if you see anyone writing in the chat box. People are saying a lot of lot of challenges, mixed levels. Mixed levels, okay, yeah. And everyone, please make sure that in your chat box, it says to all panelists and attendees. If it says only all panelists, we won't be able to see. Yeah, so I think I, I pulled up the chat box. Are you able to see that, Kelly, here? Yeah, not on yeah. your screen. I see it on mine. Okay, all right, never mind. I was going to try and show them, but... <laughs> So students with different language levels, um, groupings of three or more with a mixability class, multi-level classes. Oh. Students being shy to speak, bronze levels that refers to a level at uh, AUA. Okay. What would that be? What equivalent would that be for like a CEFR? Um, Heather, could you answer that question? Heather also has no idea. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's, Not let's... sure, but the bronze levels, they're difficult. <laughs> they're difficult. Oh, okay. Well, that, that's, a, I mean, like there are maybe high level speakers. Um, Sharon's saying that's levels one to four. Um, okay. We have another participant saying that students don't know how to do it. So I think um, maybe he or she's talking about um, groups. They don't know how to do groups. Yeah, yeah, okay. So bronze maybe refers to about A1, A2. Okay, yeah, so real lo very low level. Okay, absolutely. Um, yeah, so these are... These are um, some challenges that I hear a lot and I see a lot in Thai schools. Um, and you know, we even see them all in the US a lot too. Um, so large class sizes is very common. Um, I've heard of class sizes being 30, 40, 50 students. Um, I did a workshop actually with these roll cards uh, for teachers um, at Yala Rajabhat University and they teach 500 to 600 students. <laughs> in one class, and that's an English class. <laughs> so they can get very, very large. Um, different levels, right? We have some A1s, and then we have anywhere up to our, really, we feel like our proficient speakers. 
Um, limited resources, absolutely. I've seen classrooms without any desks. Um, children just sit on the floor. They don't have paper. They don't have, you know, teachers sometimes bring in their own pencils. Um, and then again, yeah, students, they don't really know what to do or how to do it. Um, and yeah, groupings can, they can be a challenge, but if you structure them right, um, they really kind of, you'll see they build, um, there's a lot of benefits to them. And that's kind of the goal for today um, and why I want to introduce this idea of using roll cards because it also helps train your students how to group um, in a very structured way. Okay, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and get started. Um, and if you want, you can keep writing those challenges because hopefully I will have answered uh, a few, or I will have given maybe a, a suggested solution to a few of those challenges that you wrote there in the chat box. Um, and I hope to address that by talking about roll cards with groups. Um, so there we go. So the agenda for today is I'm going to introduce the roll cards to you. Like, what are they, right? Um, and I'm going to show you four general uh, roles, but the most important thing is they're different roles. Um, there are many, many different roles that you can create or assign on your own, depending on the activity. Um, really, all you have to do is open up Google and type in roll cards, ESL, EFL, um, and you will see so many amazing lesson plans um, of teachers that have tried using this for reading, for writing, for listening, speaking, for all of the skills. Um, and so I encourage you to explore this more. This um, webinar really is only just giving you kind of a general idea. Um, so to get a better idea of how to use roll cards, um, normally I have the participants uh, do it. <laughs> and so we can't really do that in a webinar. So I'm gonna actually walk you through the steps and I'm gonna walk you through two activities that I have done before in workshops. Um, and I've also presented in Tai Chi, so a very abbreviated one. Um, and that will give you kind of an idea of different ways that you can use roll cards in your own classroom. Um, and then finally at the end, we'll discuss the benefits to using roll cards. Um, hopefully, after you've seen a couple of examples, you'll be able to contribute a few of your, your own ideas, what you think some of the benefits might be. Um, so at, so be thinking about that because at the end of this presentation, I'm going to ask you in the chat box again to write down what are some of the benefits you, you can see from using roll cards in your class. Okay. Um, so what are roll cards? <laughs> Let's get started. Um, so the first thing that you do is you divide the students into groups. Um, there are many ways that you can do that. Um, you can randomly do it. You can just number them off. You can um, strategically put them into groups. So before class, you can decide, you can do a mixture of strong students and weaker students in the groups so they're working together. Um, I've seen a whole array of ideas and, and teachers do different things. Um, but, you know, don't, I often, I personally put my students into groups very quickly because if I leave it to them, it's going to take forever. <laughs> and that's not the point of the activity. The point is uh, to get them into groups as fast as possible. Um, and the second step is let the students choose their roles. And choosing their roles is pretty, is, is pretty important, especially when you're first doing, when you're doing this activity for the first time, it'll be new for your students. They're not going to be sure what to do. So some of the roles, for example, are like the reader or the writer, or the speaker, or the group leader. Now, the group leader, or maybe the group speaker, are some of the scariest ones for students. And so I want them to choose the role that they're most comfortable with. And that will help them get used to role cards and what they're, suppo the, you know, what they're supposed to do in the sequencing of this. Um, so the third step is, um, that each role that I'm giving them is important to remember that each role has to be different. 
um, and, it, it, and, and, and it's different and it describes a very, very specific behavior or task that they have to do. Um, and that's important because that requires them all to work together. Um, can't complete the task or they don't complete it fully to, that, to, the, to the extent that the teacher wants it to or the activity is supposed to be. Um, and so that's kind of that last point there that I wanted to drive home that each role is really important um, and it really requires the students to actively participate. Um, so the roles may um, have different levels of um, it may require different levels of English speaking or listening or writing ability, but um, that's the point of the activity. Okay, so you can see here, um, just to visualize it a little bit, here's um, one workshop that we were doing where we had uh, them working together in their role cards. So you can see um, that everyone's kind of actively participating because everybody here has a role. Now this activity, they were doing surveys and they were kind of adding up all the data and summarizing it and they were using their specific role. So there was one writer, um, there's someone keeping the time, et cetera. Um, so one of the things that I hear from a lot of teachers and one of the challenges you mentioned to me is that there's a lot of students and we don't have any desks. So we can't do this. Um, it's okay, you can. This, um, I'm gonna show you a very quick video from Tai Chi Sol. I was in a fairly small room and um, there were not enough chairs. <laughs> you know, there were so many people in the presentation, but you can see that we did it anyway and we did it pretty successfully. So let's just watch the video very quickly. <laughs> Okay, so I know it's, this is, was only the really the, the, the best video that I could get from it, but um, I know a lot of, of teachers are thinking, this is chaos, this is chaotic, my students are gonna, it's gonna be loud, my, you know, and um, yeah, it will be, but that's, that's okay, you know, you've gotta let go of control, teacher, um, and give them a few minutes to put themselves into groups. Um, there are some ways that you can train them to put themselves into groups very quickly, efficiently, and safely. Um, you know, we've worked on that strategies for doing that in past presentations as well, too. Um, but, um, you know, don't, don't give up. You're, you're like, they'll do it, you know. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on to the roles. Um, so, I remember I mentioned that there, I was going to talk about four very general roles that you can use. Um, and this is really to kind of just give you an idea of um, how you can change the roles depending on the activity. So um, you'll see here that the first one I present to the students is the moderator um, or the discussion leader. Now, I present this card first because remember, I let them choose. And usually what happens is the strongest student, the most confident student, you know, that moderator, the, the class leader, they usually choose that role. Or maybe people in the group give that role to them. Um, and that's okay, right? And so I don't, I don't want the, the least confident student or maybe the student who feels like they have the shy student, I don't want them to be the leader of the speaker because that's gonna make them more uncomfortable, right? We want them to enjoy this activity first, right? <laughs> Before I really start to challenge them. Um, so it tells you exactly what you're supposed to do. Now each of these tables have their own cards um, and the card looks literally just like this. It describes them a very specific behavior. So um, it says that they tell the group what to do next. They read the directions. Um, and they and only they can ask the teacher for help. So sometimes I'll have other students raise their hand. I look at their card. They're not the discussion leader. And I, I you know, I'm kind of mean and I don't, I ignore them, right? And then the discussion leader, they get used to it and they raise their hand. And, um, now for some students who are maybe at a lower level, you can see at the bottom of the card there, like I write down some little sentence frames for them, give them a few ideas here of what to say. Some, and you can change those as well too, depending on what vocabulary you're, you're working on or what level your students are at. Okay, let's move on to the second role. So the second role is the speaker 
caller or also the reporter. Again, depends on the activity that you're trying to do. Um, again, this is uh, a role that terrifies a lot of students. So it's the second one. And usually the second strongest student <laughs> chooses this one, the one that's most confident. Um, uh, and it's, that's fine, I want them to choose these. Um, and so it, it describes a very specific behavior and it says that at the end of the activity, they will report to the class the main idea. So they're gonna be the ones that will either stand up and talk about what they, they decided to talk about. Um, and so you'll see at the bottom again, I've included a little bit of a sentence frame or something to get them started if maybe they're a less proficient speaker and they need a little bit of help. Okay, so the third role. The third role is the writer or the sketcher. So a sketcher is another word for a person who maybe just kind of draws, you know. And so this can be good for some of your learners who maybe aren't comfortable writing, right? So if they are at a lower proficiency and you want to that's fine. You can still give somebody a role um, and they could talk about it and the person can draw it instead of writing full sentences or writing the word, right? Um, and you can also change this depending on the activity. Uh, so again, you'll see that the it's a very specific behavior. They either write the words down or they draw what the other members of the group are telling them. So the important thing to remember is that there's only one person who's writing, but the other members, they have to be giving ideas and telling the person what to write. Um, so there's, you can see that there's a lot of different skills that are happening here. There's, there are speaking skills, there are listening skills, right? There are writing skills that are happening. Um, and then same at the bottom there, there's a few little sound bites or sentence frames in case, you know, the writer isn't sure what to say or how to get the conversation started. And then finally, um, the fourth general role, and you can see this almost looks like it's two roles, and you're right, it is. And so it can be broken up into two separate roles. So for those of you who have very, very large classes, um, you can have one person be the timekeeper, and you can have another person be the English enforcer. And the timekeeper is exactly what it sounds like. They watch the time. And this is really important because there are different steps to each task. And there are specific times you'll see that I give them to finish the task. And if the timekeeper isn't watching the time, well, then they get behind and they aren't able to complete the task on um, fully. Uh, and then the other role is the English enforcer. And so this person just kind of moderates the group and asks them to speak as much, or reminds them to speak as much as possible. Uh, yes, I, a, lot, a lot of you are looking at this and thinking, oh, these roles aren't equal. And they aren't, they absolutely are not, but that's okay. Um, you know, if you're, you're, you're a student who never ever speaks English at all, the really the one who's super shy, you know, the least they can do is watch the time and they can read the sound bite and say, you know, we only have, four minutes, we only have two minutes, right? It's something as simple as that really just builds up their confidence. And um, if you repeat this activity throughout the semester, um, throughout, if you repeat this activity regularly with your students, like every week, um, every other class, if you have class every day, um, they get used to these roles and they switch the roles. And so they become more and more confident. I've seen this happen, so. Okay, so these are our four general uh, roles that you can use. You can break them up, you can create different ones. Um, so uh, what I wanna do is I wanna kind of introduce uh, the first activity that I usually do. This is a very simple one um, to kind of show you, give you an idea of how we do role cards. Um, so I, I, but I want all the participants to also kind of, uh, participate in this one because it is it is so easy. So um, this first one is called I see, I think, I wonder. So I, I'm gonna give you one minute. So you'll see this, this timing here is really important. So I'm gonna watch the clock and I'm gonna give you one minute. Um, and in that minute, I want you to just look at the photo. So this is, this is silent time, right? So you're just looking. There's no writing, you're just looking 
I tell the students they can come up to the board, they can look up a photo if they want. Um, if it's a very, very large class with four or 500 students, you can post the photo ahead of time on the Facebook group or the line group, and you can have them pull their phones out and pull the photo up and look at it. Um, but it's just one minute, one minute to just kind of look at the photo, look at what you see, pay attention to some of the details, And if my class is particularly low level um, and I don't have, let's say, a picture dictionary or something, um, I will let them use their translators or, you know, it's not really, this, this activity is mostly about, um, you know, working in groups and, and speaking fluency. Um, and it's maybe not particularly about, you know, challenging their or testing their vocabulary. So it's okay if they translate it um, or they look up a word. Absolutely. We let them do that. Okay. Okay. Um, so you'll see here now that I've moved on. So now I'm going to give the students one more minute and I want them to think of three statements. And you'll see that I started them here. And the first one is starts with I see. So students are going to be writing down a fact, right? Something that they see. I think, so this is kind of something a little bit more opinion based, right? Something maybe you're not sure of. So I want you to complete the statement with what you, you think about the photo. Um, and then the final one is kind of a question that you have, right? I wonder. But this is in a statement form. So it's the first one is fact, opinion, and then question. Now, if your class is a little bit more of a lower level, you can create a larger sentence, right? You can say, I wonder if, and then, right, you can start it off a little bit more because they know it is kind of a complex structure, right? Now, this time is really, um, it's silent time. Uh, they aren't talking yet. And um, I wanted to show you this photo you, so you could see that I did this in another workshop you see they have the photo there and someone's walking up to look really closely at the photo because there's some detail. But they're not, they're just looking. They're not talking, they're not discussing, they're not doing anything. Um, and so, they, so this is really kind of this, the silent time allowing them to really kind of think about um, the, the photo and then create their, their three sentences. So they're not doing any group work yet. So what I would like you to do participants is I want you to think of these three statements. So think about what you see, what you think, and what you wonder about the photo. And if you could, could you please write it down inside the chat box? I see somebody has already started. Um, I will go back to the photo because <laughs> sometimes I know that helps. <laughs> Um, and again, I allow my students to pull out their phones and use their dictionaries um, to look up a word. It's, this is not a vocabulary test. Um, this is really to kind of build fluency, build learner autonomy. If they don't know a word, not to give up, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna give you a minute. So I'd like, if you could, participants, please, just type into the chat box three statements. I see, what do you see, right? I think, so I see an animal, right? What do you think? I think it's happy. And what do you wonder? I wonder where they are. <laughs> so I'll give you one minute for that. And I'll let the participants, see so we have a few, a few at, there we go, wonderful.
So Allison, you you have some interesting responses here. Uh, yeah, they, <clears throat> they always are. And so this is something I wanted to mention to you is um, try to choose a really interesting photo, something that um, you know will your students are going to wonder about, right? Or they're going to think um, something that you think might create discussion. Because remember, they're going to get into groups and they're going to share their ideas. Um, and some of them are going to have very different ideas, right? Yeah, interestingly, some people are, are looking at her as, as an artist and others are thinking that she's doing this for tourism and wondering if she's hurting the camel. Oh, interesting. See, these are, yeah, this is usually with, when you choose a kind of photo like this, you get two totally different ideas. Um, and the, the fun part is, in, in, you know, the part that we want as teachers to get our students talking is when they start telling what they, their three statements, um, everyone is surprised to hear what they think, right? Or what they wonder, right? And so it actually sometimes creates a little bit of debate or discussion or even argument sometimes. <laughs> I've heard students argue about them. Um, so I'm not sure if, it, do we wanna start to go over some of them, kind of share some ideas? Sure. So some people are wondering if this was some sort of celebration for a holiday. Um, and as you mentioned, what country this might be in. Um, I was asking, I wonder what the symbol on the hump might mean. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Look at the little symbol. Um, and on the neck, actually. Yeah, there's a little symbol here. You're right. Um, and Sharon's wondering if maybe this is for some sort of celebration. Um, Someone else was asking if it were for tourism of some sort. Um, basically, why seems to be a big question. Why is she doing this? Right. Oh, and there's, so the other thing I wanted to point out, I, I see right here from um, the chat that someone said someone is carving on the camel. That's an excellent vocab word. Um, I get some great vocabulary words sometimes um, that's just, like incidental vocabulary, we like to call it, or vocabulary that maybe we aren't necessarily studying. Um, and so for some of our low level learners, uh, sometimes when I'm hearing them say their statements, I'll write the words on the board and we'll create a word wall. And that will allow the lower level learners to see the word, maybe look it up, right? So they can kind of catch up on, catch up um, it, when the other students are talking. So carving is a good one, yeah. Um, yeah, so we have some some ideas. So, um, you know, one of the questions I that I also had was, I wonder where this is. Um, you know, for example, there are elephants we see, right? But they're camels, <laughs> um, which normally we see in maybe the Middle East, where we wouldn't see an elephant. Um, and then maybe looking at the person who's carving, uh, is it for tourism? Um, you know, she maybe looks like she's from somewhere in Asia. Um, although the design, I don't know, maybe looks a little Indian, I'm not sure. Um, so I've heard so many different um, discussions going on and different ideas going on when the students are in their pairs. Um, so I'm going to walk you through what I normally do. So you see the first minute is, really, is silent time. The second minute, that gives the students the time to really look up the words. Um, that they want to write down, um, you know, thinking time, right, right before they share. Um, so here's an example again of it was an individual work. There was no talking yet, and you want to make sure you really emphasize that for your students. That's their time to really kind of, you know, look up words and, and, and think um, before they share. And then I move on and I say, okay, are you ready? So using your roles, share and record everyone's statement. Now I have. This, you'll see there's six minutes on there. Sorry, I can't, you'll see that there's six minutes up there. Um, and the six minutes, uh, you can change depending on your class. If you have a low level class, you're going to maybe need more time. If the activity is a little bit more difficult, you're going to need a little bit more time, right? Um, I did this uh, with um, uh, 
English uh, teaching assistants who have all come from the United States. And so uh, that was really fast. They only took two or three minutes to write every, <laughs> I share and record everyone's statement. Um, but I don't really give them much directions because remember that's the discussion leader's job is to make sure everyone's on task, right? And really all I do as the teacher is I just kind of walk around and observe. Um, and, you know, if somebody has a question, they, you know, raise their hand. Um, and I don't really have to do much. Um, I set my own timer, right? So I know when the six minutes is up. And that's pretty important because after the six minutes, if their timer in each group hasn't been watching the time, I move on to the next slide and then it's too late. Um, and so sometimes if they forget to time or the one student isn't really doing anything or their job was the timer and they thought it was going to be easy and they're, you know, not, not really paying attention, then the group kind of gets upset at them, right? <laughs> so they, 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 you know, they, they kind of organize themselves and then the discussion leader then usually will then say, timer, what time is it, right? Um, so again, it, it's all about getting your, your students, it's kind of training them how to work within a group. So, um, you know, it is, it is they, they are learning English, but they're also learning how to socialize, right? Um, so the, I don't, you know, I move the slide on and I say, okay, discussion leaders, you know what to do. Um, Tell your group what to do. I don't even read the slide, right? I don't talk about it. That's the discussions we do. The discussion leader's job is to give the directions. So I start the timer again um, and I wait four minutes. Um, and you can see that the next stage here is they, after they've recorded every single person's statement, which can take a lot of time, right? Because the person has to say it and they have to listen and write it, right? Um, then the group discusses. And then the group decides on one statement that they're going to make about what they see, what they think, and what they wonder. And this is the part where they have to kind of compromise and decide on one, you know, this is the cooperative part, this is like the collaborative part, they're really kind of working together and they've got to compromise on this um, because they only get to say one of them. Um, and sometimes I try to keep that to four minutes because sometimes they can um, really get into some arguments. And then after four minutes, I move on. Um, and you can see here from a photo um, that there was, you know, lots of group work. You see the person was writing at the front here. Um, and uh, one of the important things about the writer's job is, you know, they need to also be good listeners and the other person needs to be a good speaker. So um, you can see they're not just showing them what they wrote and they're just copying it. They're, they're actually saying it and the writer's listening and writing down what they heard. So um, it, you get lots of, lots of practice using all the four skills here. And then after the four minutes, I move on to the next slide and I say, okay, are you ready? And if they're not finished, they're not finished. And if they haven't decided, they haven't decided. Um, you know, and that's, the groups kind of realize the consequence of not following the time and not having the structure. Again, the first time you do this, like it, you know, it may seem a little chaotic, but the idea is about repetition use these roll cards many, many times. In fact, use them for all, you know, if you have enough time and you meet every day, do a short activity with roll cards every day. Um, and your students will get used to the roles and they really kind of embrace them. Okay, and so you'll see that this is the last person's role as speaker. You'll see that they're standing up here and she is reading off the statement that they decided, the group consensus. Um, a little background of this photo here. This group was the group I'm talking about that argued quite a bit <laughs> and could not agree. So I, you know, that's why I'm like, it's important that sometimes to think about your students and if they do argue a lot, maybe cut them off with a shorter time amount of time. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to move on to um, a second. I want to move on to the second activity that I wanted to show you and I wanted to sequence. Now this activity is a um, it's a writing, I'm going to call it a writing dominant activity. Now you can see that roll cards use all the skills, right? Um, but this one in particular is going to be focusing a little bit more on the writing aspect. Um, why did I choose writing? Well, I chose writing because uh, most of my teachers and in most of the workshops I hear teachers think of um, 
writing as a solitary activity, like students do it alone. And um, a lot of students fear writing because writing can be very difficult. Um, but I want to I want to show you that you can have the students work together to create um, sentences, paragraphs, or even whole essays. Um, and that really just kind of builds their confidence. And so they can do that then later on their own. Right. Okay. So um, the topic is the ideal house. Now, um, I actually got this idea um, from my colleague, uh, Mindy, um, who teaches at Burapa, and she had seen this from another English language specialist who talked about using rules with group grading. Um, you don't have to write the ideal house. Um, you can do, let's say, the ideal food, if that is it, what interests your students, or if that's what you're studying at that moment is food, right? Um, you can say the ideal classroom, if you want to make it, you know, real for them, right? Um, you, you, can, you can definitely change this to whatever you're studying at the moment um, in your own classes. Okay, so um, step one is, this is important. If this is the second, third, fourth, fifth, 20th time they've been doing it, I want them to switch roles, do a role that they haven't done um, before or one that they, maybe they don't immediately choose. Um, the important idea is to get them to be switching roles constantly. And so even, you know, your, your shyest student who maybe only wants to be the, the timekeeper, um, they're kind of, they, as, as they do this, they build up a little more confidence and they're kind of forced to, to, to try a new role out, right? Um, step two is I have a students think of a wonderful house. And again, uh, I put the time up there, the three minutes of open conversation. Um, and, I, and I allow them to just kind of think about it, just kind of discuss it openly. And then step three, um, I have a new slide, right? So remember the importance is, it's not about the teacher, right? You want the leader, the discussion leader to be doing everything. So I, I really am, I'm watching my time, the time mostly so I can just move on to the next slide um, or the, the next of the directions and then if I've moved on to the next slide, it's the discussion leader's responsibility to notice that that's happened and, and tell them what to do next and kind of get the group organized. Um, so the third step, you'll see here, um, this utilizes, uses the sketcher. So the first step of this wonderful house is to draw it. And so they get to describe how to draw it. They say, oh, I want it to have, um, you know, four, rooms or oh I wanted to have chickens in the front or oh I wanted to be the, by the beach or right and so they have to kind of talk about this with the sketcher so you'll see here that in this one I've actually divided the rules between there's a sketcher rule and there's a writer rule these are two separate roles it's one person who just draws oh, sorry it's very loud one person who just draws and then there's another person who will be writing later Step four, okay, so different rule. This is now where the writer steps in. So the writer labels everything on the picture. Now, um, usually I'll give them a, a picture dictionary if we're dealing with house vocabulary or food vocabulary. Um, um, if you're doing something a little bit more complicated or complex, so you, you don't have a picture dictionary, you can have them use their own in dictionaries, um, translators, Google, right? Uh, you really just want them to learn that when they don't know a word, don't give up, right? Find a way to look it up or figure it out. So they have to label everything, right? And this is like a good vocab. I love, well, my students love labeling things anyway. <laughs> um, they can ask questions, they can ask me if they want, if they really don't know what the word is, I can help them out, right? Um, but it's the writer's job to label it and then the others are kind of helping along, right? And then step four, or sorry, step five, excuse me. Um, the writer writes down what the group decides the speaker should say. So you'll see here that the writer has a lot to do now. So now they have to describe what this house is like. And so they're gonna, this is where you get to the actual writing part. This is where you get those sentences where they're describing what the house looks like. And so everything that they said in um, step two and in step three, now they're actually gonna be writing it down with the help 
of the group, right? So you, you get everybody involved and everybody's really kind of contributing. So you can see kind of here's an image of them doing that. You'll see one, they have the, 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 the sketch has been labeled and you'll see the writer here. Um, again, she's a teacher, so she was writing a lot. Um, most of my students don't write this much, um, so don't worry about that. But uh, you'll see that we had two separate roles. Okay, and then the final step, right? The final step is um, the speaker will present to the class, right? So um, uh, usually I'll give them, um, if it's a lower level class, or you know how fast the students can present, maybe one to two minutes, right? Um, and you'll see here, here's an example of them presenting. One student was holding the photo up, and another student was showing um, and describing. And notice she wasn't reading from the paper. Um, you know, I was really, for this one, we were talking about encouraging fluency. And so, you know, she was used to paper as notes, but um, she wasn't reading. So that was kind of the goal for that activity. Okay. So um, those are the two, uh, two activities or tasks um, that I've used for um, roll cards. Um, there's so many out there. I just wanted to give you kind of an idea of what they look like and how you can use them in two different realms, right? And so um, now I want you to kind of reflect. Uh, you've seen two different ways to use these roll cards. And I want you to think about um, what I mentioned at the beginning, which is think about the challenges that you originally wrote about in the chat box. And I want you to think about what is one benefit to using roll cards in your own classroom? How can you see this being a good thing or helping your class or helping address some of those challenges that you wrote originally? So I'm gonna give you um, a couple of minutes and you can just go ahead and type into the chat box, you know, what do you think, what are some of the benefits? Just one or two, if you've got many. <laughs> Share your idea. So Allison, you have some great responses here. Yeah, okay. Do you wanna, um, should we give another minute or do you wanna start reading off some of them? We can let yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah, so just I'll first share some of my ideas. Um, one of the things that I said is I think it would be really helpful in keeping students on task and it makes um, everybody in a group accountable for success. So one person doesn't end up doing all the work. Yeah, um, other I, I've, I've seen it happen before <laughs> where yeah. they kind of get mad at the timekeeper or the, you know, yeah. Some other comments, um, roll cards allow everyone to get involved. Um, also, Heather mentioned that it's a good idea to make it part of a routine, which I think is really important um, because then the students do get more confident with their roles. Yes, that's the important thing is the routine. So um, a lot of these activities can go really, really fast. Like the I see, I think, I wonder. I mean, you can do this uh, maybe at the beginning of every class is a really quick warm up, right? Depending on the level of your students um, and how long you have. Um, but if you make it a routine for your students, then they, 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 they already know what the roles are. So they spend less time really kind of thinking about that and more time really kind of working on the task of the vocabulary. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And others are noting it helps, again, along with the routine, it helps students know what to do so they can actively participate. 
Mm -hmm. um, it allows them to have active participation, error correction, um, opinion giving, um, kind of some self-help gaining knowledge. Yeah, yeah. So um, opinion giving, that's important, right? Because that's kind of one of the first steps to critical thinking, right? And um, I, you know, we always kind of freeze when we hear the, I know in class when I say why, <laughs> and the students look, uh-oh. <laughs> so, you know, it also kind of builds up their confidence to, you know, give an opinion, right? Or um, how, to, how to phrase that or work that out, right? Um, okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and um, it looks like, you know, we've, you guys uh, got a lot of the benefits. Um, there are so many. Here are just a few of them that I, I've written down and um, that I found are good is um, it's cooperative, right? So each, each student has something that they have to do, right? And so they have to work together. Um, and when they don't, um, you know, it, 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 it some, sometimes we have, they don't end up finishing the task, right? Um, the second thing uh, that's nice is it's differentiation. I think, Kelly, I think you, you'd mentioned a lot of the participants said that that was one of the benefits is, you know, each role kind of um, emphasizes a different skill, right? Um, there are super simple ones like just timekeeping. And yes, I know they're not fair, but that's okay. It's, you know, some of our students, they're, they're, you know, at a low level and they're just beginning to kind of build up their confidence. There may be some students who we know as teachers have a higher level, but maybe they're a little bit shy, right? And so maybe they need to build their confidence up for the speaking role. Maybe they can do that by working together in the group, you know, just telling their opinions to the writer first, right? Um, so it's not necessarily about level, it's also, you know, about building the student's confidence up to, the, let's say, the speaker, right? Or maybe um, teaching students how to be a leader, like the discussion leader, how to, you know, organize a group, right? Um, the choosing part is, you know, I personally feel like it's really important to let them choose so they feel comfortable. And then, you know, I do make them switch roles. And so, um, you know, after a while, so they do eventually have to take on a role that they maybe are less comfortable with, but the ones that maybe aren't the natural leaders, they'll end up doing that last. And by that time, they will have seen many of their peers be leaders. And so they will have models, student models, right? And, and so that will also help build their confidence too. They will see what it, look, what it looks like, right? Um, uh, large numbers, right? Um, that was kind of, that was, what was my challenge I, I mentioned, I hear so much. Um, this is so, so important because getting your students into groups, what it really does is if, whether you have 50 students or you have 500 students, it really just turns each table or each group into its own mini classroom. And the discussion leader really kind of becomes the leader, the teacher sort of, right? And so it, 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 it makes it less teacher-centered and it's more of a student-centered activity, right? Um, now teachers, I have to remind you, yes, it's going to be a little chaotic and yes, your students will probably also use their second or their third language or sometimes their fourth language to, to talk, but that's okay. You know, this, if the, you know, the activity is getting to work in groups and um, you know, sometimes they, they need to do that translanguaging right? They, sometimes they need to move back and forth in between their language. Sometimes it is a little chaotic, right? If you find that, you know, they're really off task, sometimes, you know, remember, I'm the facilitator, I'm the teacher, I'm really just walking around. And so sometimes I use the power of just walking close to the table that's not doing any work. And they see me, <laughs> they know. <laughs> so then they start to get back on task, right? You know, and so, you know, it doesn't get, I don't have to get involved. I don't have to do anything, right? Just, I'm just kind of move around and listening, helping when they need help, right? Things like that. But yes, teacher, you gotta let go. Sometimes they will be off task, right? But let them figure that out, right? That's a part of it. Um, another benefit is interpersonal skills. So I mentioned this before. It's about socializing too, right? Um, and I think Kelly, I saw in one of the, the, the in the chat box that somebody wrote one of the benefits was um, it teaches students how to be respectful. Is that, was that what I saw? 
Yes, uh, respect for fo fellow colleagues, yes. Yeah, yeah, and so, you know, that's the important part of putting these like sentence frames or sentences that kind of, you know, show them polite language to like, maybe if the, the group is off task, like how can you politely put them back on track, right? Or if you're running out of time, how, well, how can we politely s s tell the group, hurry up? Right. <laughs> um, and so it's also teaching them like these polite ways of saying things and being polite in these interpersonal skills and working with groups, which is it's something that you're, you know, our students are going to need to do, even if they, you know, in their job, in college, in, you know, the future, they're always going to be working in groups somehow, um, whether they're using English or their native language, um, you know, they're still going to need to learn how to work in groups. Uh, and then one of the final, the final benefits that I really like about this is um, my favorite learner autonomy. Um, so it's really just kind of teaching students how to become, how to do a task on their own. Um, so really large tasks like writing a paragraph or um, even for those low level class, writing a sentence is super difficult. And it breaks down these really large, hard tasks into manageable. Um, chunks or manageable pieces and you're working together with the group as well and so I feel like that helps my students kind of build a little bit more confidence um, your strong your stronger students they you know they, they kind of help out the little of the weaker students and they serve as the model right and so it, 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 it works it really does it helps kind of build these good habits of learner autonomy or starts them off on that track okay um, so, because I'm sharing my slide with you, I actually don't know how we're doing on time. Kelly, would you like to uh, <laughs> help me out here? <laughs> yeah, we have a few minutes. If people have questions, please go okay, ahead and great. put them into the chat box. We have maybe three minutes for questions. Okay. You're getting lots of thanks and applause. Thank you, attendees, for coming. Yeah, well, thank you. Wow, wonderful. Um, are there any questions though? I know we have a couple of minutes. Um, I'm more than happy to um, answer any questions. Uh, I will also, um, at the end of this, I will uh, show you my email and my line ID. I will also show you the um, references. So um, the uh, web addresses for the photos that I found, they're always engaging. Um, I will also show you the web address for using roll cards in the classroom. So some more ideas on how you can use roll cards. There's a, web, there's a very good website um, as well that you can, you can go to. So I'll show you those um, at the end of the presentation. And so um, this webinar will be, well, it's live now, but um, the recording will be put up on our YouTube page. And so you can always go back and rewatch this, or you can always go back and look at the, um, the references at the end. Um, Allison, a question. Um, what are some examples of other roles that you've used in groups? Um, so another one I've used is for reading. Um, I uh, love to encourage reading. Um, and so starting by reading in groups, um, it was, Something I, I, I want, it's, it's best to do when in a workshop where in the teachers um, and the students are actually doing it first, uh, but I use it to, I use the roles to break down um, hard parts of reading. So for example, one of the roles will be the main idea of person and their job is to only, only find the main idea of the paragraph or the main idea of the, the essay or the passage. Another role will be a, the detailed person, and they, their only role is to find two or three details, right, that they think are important, key details, right? And then another role will be a vocabulary person, and they choose two or three interesting vocabulary words, and they talk about why they thought those terms were interesting, right? Um, and so it, it breaks reading up into um, smaller, more manageable chunks, and then they come together as a group, and they talk about the reading together and so it makes makes re understanding the reading passage or the paragraph or the essay um, or even the short story a little bit easier when you're talking about it with your peers um, as well as they're, they're working on fluency right and again it's um, a group activity thank you Allison um, maybe can we 
can we end on a difficult question? Oh, uh, sh sure, yeah. So how do you think teachers can observe all the students um, and see if they're on track or if they're speaking English? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, um, they won't always be speaking English and that's okay. Right. Um, you know, a part of this is is building up this learner autonomy. And so, you know, teachers, that includes me, we have to let go of control. Right. Um, one person's job is to be the English enforcer. And I often find that that person loves their job. <laughs> in fact, to a very strict, strict standard. And so they usually put that person in check um, or they usually are the person that's like speaking English. Um, again, you as the facilitator, as the teacher, I don't say anything, but I am walking around the classroom and you can use, you know, if you see, for example, maybe a group is not on task or you hear them using a lot of Thai or a lot of Isan or a lot of, you know, whatever their, their, um, the, the language is predominantly spoken, uh, you can just kind of just casually walk by the group, right? And, you know, just kind of look around and they obviously see you as the teacher um, and they know to get back on the task, right? Um, and then how to, was it just, was that just it, how to observe? Yeah, and then actually a couple of more questions are coming in. So okay. um, uh -huh. one is, do you think it's necessary to teach them how to start the sentence first if they have low levels of English? And then second, have you ever used a demo with a group of students to first show the class how they should interact and speak and work together? So kind of having students role play it first. Yeah, yeah. It, usually we do that with the I see that I think I wonder because it's the easiest one. That's usually how I start off with. That's the, pra the practice round, right? Um, and uh, then, you know, after once they get used to that, then, then I... Um, maybe we do a couple more. I see. I think they wonders with a different photo, right? And I have, I have them switch roles. We practice again. Um, so that that one. That's why I wanted to kind of show that one because it's usually one of the easier ones for students. Um, even those low level students really get into it because the photos are very interesting. Um, and even if it's something as simple as one or two words, right? Um, in terms of the how to start off the sentences. You know, I started with IC, but if you want to, if you want to cr create more of a, a longer sentence, that's fine too. Um, if you're just starting out with your learners writing um, and you're just doing, you know, subject, verb, object, then that's okay too. Um, you can maybe take out the last one. If you're teaching an A1, I wonder is really hard. Um, so take out that last one. Don't have an I wonder, right? Just have the I see and I think, right? Um, you, you can make it a little bit easier that way too. Great. Well, thank you so much, Allison, for this informative yeah. webinar. Lots of, lots of thanks coming in. Um, and I really appreciate your volunteering for this February webinar. On behalf of AUA Language Center and Relo Bangkok, we thank you for coming to our webinar. Everyone in the Attend attendees category. Our next webinar will be in one month on Thursday, March 14th at 5 p.m. You can follow us on Relo Bangkok and AUA Language Center's Facebook pages, and you'll find updates there about when and where you can join the webinar. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great night. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>